uh, I want to give the floor now uh, to the first speaker of the second subsession, uh, Dr. Lakshman Rodrigo from Rural Research Institute of Sri Lanka. Uh, so please, uh, Dr. Lakshman, uh, you, the floor is yours. You are the first speaker about the uh, subsession on adaptation. Please share your slides. Can you hear me now? Yes, no, yes, yes. Uh, how about slides? You must share your screen. Uh, slides are okay? No. No? Share your screen using the green button. Uh, yes, uh, wait a minute. Uh, share screen. Oh, yeah. Uh, give me a second. Uh, uh, what the? 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 Green one. Green one. Is that okay now? Still, yes. still yes. same or? No, no, it's okay. No. No. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Go on slide. Uh, slide show. Right, you can see. Can see. Can see. Ah, then it's all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got confused. Uh, slide. Slide show. Yes. Slide show. Right. Ah. Yes. Slide show. Hmm. Uh, Right side, so. Hmm? Why is not here? Uh, side show. Again, view again. Let's view. Insert. But it's not there. I want to get into the slide show. Uh, slide. Uh, yes. Is that all right now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now much improved. Oh, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the trouble. Especially due to some other logos and things, we can't see all the icons. <laughs> Uh, uh, you are, you are already late. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Again, the good morning, either good morning or good afternoon to depending on your country, where you are. And this is about the rubber cultivation in the non-traditional areas in Sri Lanka. And at the same time, what we want to demonstrate here is to uh, show you that I mean, even though rubber is partly affected by the climate change, as we learned throughout the yesterday and today, Still, that may it help us to uh, have the, the social and environmental resilience to the, face the climate change, especially the climatic variability. That's what uh, we want to demonstrate with the uh, Sri Lankan evidence. And when we talk about the non traditional areas, we mostly go for the drier climates. Our traditional areas are more towards the Colombo area, the wet, uh, wet zone. Now we are moving to the uh, drier climates. And some studies conducted by Disaster Management Center, they show especially those areas are highly vulnerable to climate change. To make you evident that the, how it's happened like, to look at the last more than several decades of the data gathering, they showed that I mean, especially uh, the crop loss in those areas are uh, very high, especially those areas are rain fit, especially the Eastern and Uber provinces where we promote the rubber cultivation. The, those areas normally people grow seasonal crops on uh, under rain fed cultivation. Therefore, the, they are highly vulnerable for climatic variability. Only up to the 2008. Again, we experienced another drought in 2009. Again, we, we evident that in even the special that time, the groundwater even very small amount in their beds. Again, the temperature was high, but the thing is, especially if you look at the, what happened to rubber, because we started rubber cultivation in those areas in the eastern point in 2003. 
and uh, with the three small holdings then the two only two are successful due to the, all these social other factors because people are not used to the rubber cultivation and uh, however due to drought only the rubber planted in the previous year that means 2008 was affected even though it's a bad sign for rubber but still it's a good sign because uh, if you can pass few years after establishment then we can go with the rubber if we just compare with the condition in the non traditional drier climates against the traditional high climate, the one biggest difference is the rainfall, of course. The, um, in the non traditional areas, we have drier climates, we have less than um, 2,500 millimeter annual rainfall compared to the wet zone, sometimes go up to 5,000 uh, millimeters even. Then the low humidity, then high temperature, then the may more droughts. Again, the, especially in traditional areas, we have the only dry spells, not the drought much. However, if you look at the social factors, then we can see the uh, uh, high land per capita, because especially having a low population density, we can see very high land per capita in non-traditional areas. And then again, again, the land value is very low, and people use land for uh, rain bed cultivation. And again, if you look at the livelihood of the farmers, they are more dependent on the on-farm activity. They are real farmers, not like the farmers in the traditional areas. They are the, just like absentee landlords. They hire other people to cultivate rubber. And therefore, again, the lab, labor availability is much higher in those areas. And anyway, then after introducing rubber initially, that's in 2000, end of 2003, we conducted the short analysis in 2005 in the particular village where we started rubber. Just to see how farmers perceive, that means the what are the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats. In the st strength, we can see, as I mentioned earlier, the land availability in the rank as a first place, in the first place. Then the farmers' interest was much higher. And the, then again, soil fertility, the experience in farming, they, the farmer perceive that's the biggest strength they have, one of the biggest strengths, and the labor availability. Again, if you look at the weaknesses, the lack of knowledge, the problem with the land ownership, because that's very much important in Sri Lanka, especially if you want to, if we want to give some subsidy payment for the farmers, they have to uh, show their I mean, land uh, ownership. They have to prove that I mean, land ownership. There's some issues because especially both the land they cultivate uh, uh, belongs to that been belongs to that uh, crown lands been used by the farmers for very long, several decades, like. Um, more than sometimes over five decades, like, and then uh, use the for seasonal crops. Another weakness is again the dry, uh, as mentioned early dry periods, and the, again the seeds see some. Uh, I mean, seasonal demand for labor also some issues there because especially during the cropping the cultivation periods, there's high demand for labor. Then again, farmers perceive that mean as opportunities, the extension service for rubber would come in uh, to compensate their, that mean to make them knowledgeable on rubber cultivation. And then people were looking for subsidy schemes. And uh, then again, with the rubber, they are thinking that they can confirm their land ownership because if they can cultivate rubber instead of a seasonal crop, they can keep the land for 30 years without any problem, any issue. Therefore, that's uh, another tool to confirm their land ownership. Again, next thing is the uh, new generation, new income generation activities. The, again, the, if you look at the threats, the drought, pests and diseases, the cyclone, prior rubber price, and the wild animals, the attack of wild animals are uh, con considered as threats. But that means that we conducted this uh, study in 2005. The last 15 years, even we experienced the drought effect is not, is to, there are some extent. But pests and diseases were confined to just uh, one only for brown root disease for in few locations. Then cyclones, not really in the rubber affected area. Then wild animals also only in few plots because uh, some hunters are there. And if you look at the economic feasibility of the rubber cultivation in the other, especially in the eastern pines, and uh, at the moment we have to date we have about 400 hectares. That's a good sign to show the, the possibility of establishing rubber in that area. Then the yields are recording over 1,200 kilograms per hectare per year. Then the, we conduct a small assessment in the 14 sites, including 14 smallholder sites. 
where we can see the girth increment rate is about 7.4 centimeter per year. That means about within the seven years, like the plants can achieve the tappable stage. And then we we'll look at the environmental uh, advantages uh, with the uh, rubber cultivation. We made few uh, measurements, that means some uh, diurnal measurements on uh, smallholder sites. Uh, it shows that mean with the rubber cultivation compared to seasonal crops, it uh, improves the, that means reduces the uh, air temperature within the rubber plantations. And in addition, improve the, uh, the reduce the uh, air temperature and improve the uh, relative humidity. It's just like a giving natural air condition compared to the hard life the farmers have in these areas. Therefore, they can have some sort of comfortable living that's quite important, especially building up the uh, environmental resilience against the climate change. Then, in addition, they have the, uh, the, the some indication of the uh, soil, uh, less in soil temperature and high in soil moisture content. And then I'll move into the, the social advantages or the how the how much the rubber helped to build up the social resilience to the climate change. Then for that, what we did was we assessed the all the livelihood capital assets. In the livelihood capital assets, the financial, physical, then again the social, and those the assets we uh, checked uh, with the 34 farmers. Uh, from the east, I mean, we select the 34 farmers have been the all the at that time we had the 34 farmers have been rubber tapped, those farmers, and then the non rubber farmers. If you go into details, the first, uh, if you look at the fire financial capital, in the financial capital, you can see number of farmers having the, the mostly, the most of the rubber farmers are in high income category now compared to non rubber farmers. It gives indication that means their financial capital has been building up. Then if you move into the human capital, that is demonstrated by the expenditure pattern of the farmers. Then again, see the expenditure pattern also the change much, especially more expenditure for foods, then education, not only for the farmer, that means in the whole family, and then the healthcare, then the social work, and then again, liability, just like a leasing vehicles so or those things, that means then so down payments. All those things have been tremendously improved with the rubber cultivation, the income uh, obtained from rubber cultivation. Just a one small photograph you can see, that means the, the daughter of a one rubber farmer, she won the uh, national award for the dancing com in a dancing competition. And uh, because that's, I mean, everything was supported by the income generated from the rubber. It gives the, the, I mean, the improvement of the human capital. And then if you look at the improvement in the physical capital with the rubber cultivation, then again, all these houses were renovated, the cement floors, and then there's the cement floor wall, and then buses, roofing. That means modernization of the, that means uh, rebuilding houses, then again, the furniture, all those things are improved physically. In addition, the farm vehicles, if you look at the agriculture side, farm machinery, farm vehicles, uh, are more towards the uh, rubber farmers compared to non-rubber farmers because of the wealth improved with the rubber cultivation. Then the, the social capital, that's reflected by the how farmer uh, engage in the social activities and then especially the two elements. One is the, uh, the financial side, money lending capacity, then helping other, uh, other villagers or neighbors in the money lending. And then the, how they spend their leisure time. They visit relatives, visit religious places, and visit friends, or, and the community participating, the uh, societal work. All those things have been improved with the uh, rubber uh, with the, uh, with rubber farmers compared to non-rubber farmers. It all together shows that I mean, how much livelihood improvement we can observe with the rubber farmers, and then definitely it gives a high level of resilience to the climate change because our, all are worried about climate change because ultimately it upset our day-to-day -day living and not only the that mean how we feel the temperature but again the livelihood and there's another evidence just show that what appeared in one uh, our sunday newspaper in 2017 demonstrating how the hubber came to a one disabled uh, person to build up their life because he was a, he was not a real farmer he was a carpenter at the beginning, but due to the accident, he, he became disabled. 
because fortunately he had the rubber is partly neglected the rubber land because he planted rubber as other people are, uh, were planting rubber at that time however ultimately the savior was the rubber cultivation because of the rubber cultivation now about uh, say 80% of their family income uh, came from the rubber that's the big sign to give the how much rubber helps to build up the social res residues with that uh, then again i just I mean, with that it confirmed the, the all the rubber and the help to build up the social and environment resilience but especially when you talk about the environmental uh, benefits of the rubber because that benefit is not only for the rubber farmers in the particular area therefore we are now uh, trying to build up a voluntary carbon project uh, with the rubber cultivation in the uh, in the eastern and uh, especially dampar and work province we have a special project to cultivate rubber targeting uh, 2500 hectares and uh, with that we are expect to build up a carbon credit um, i mean 450 metric tons of carbon dioxide carbon units uh, and expected uh, earning is 2.25 definitely i think we can build up the project towards the end of the this year there are some delay due to the covid incident but towards the end of the year we could uh, build up the project and next year probably we, we can uh, that project will be in the market and with that what we expect is not just to get the money that means ultimately all these money whatever funds generated through the carbon trading will be diverted to the again the society the farmers who cultivate contributed for um, from the cultivation in those areas to build up their livelihood ultimately again uh, giving the high level of resilience to the climate change with the livelihood improvement uh, that's Dr. Lakshman, you have only two minutes. Two minutes left. Oh, that's over. That's what I want to mention. Thank you very much. Okay. Just to conclude, that means rubber okay. is ideal, even though it's been partly affected with the climate change, but it's beneficial for to build up the social and environmental resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lakshman, for respecting the time. Uh, without uh, losing any time, I'm, I know going to give the floor to the last presenter for this today's session. Uh, Dr. Eric Pono from CIRAD, who is speaking, going to speak about agroforestry. Okay, I, I hope you hear me because my uh, internet yeah. is a little bit weak. So I'm currently sharing the screen. It's okay. If it uh, wants to work. We see your face, but not your screen. Okay. Is it okay? Yes, okay, go on. Okay, so um, I suppose I have to go directly to the PowerPoint to move from one to another one. I know it's okay, okay. Okay, so uh, the role of rubber agroforestry in farming system and its effect on the household. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a work that, uh, that began 25 years ago in Indonesia with uh, uh, the good friends of IRI, in particular Gede Wibawa and uh, Thomas and other people, ICRAF, and also people from Thailand, uh, from uh, TSU, uh, Taksin University, and uh, Kunkan University in Thailand. So um, we present a little bit some results about uh, this uh, rubber agroforestry system. Yeah. Eric, uh, can you go to the slideshow? Uh, what do you mean by to go to a slideshow? Uh, we do not see your, your slides in slide uh, mode. We see uh, your PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Uh, the thing is that open, I don't, I don't have diapo, access. It's very funny because I don't have. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, is it okay? Yes. Okay, sorry, sorry. Because I didn't have access to my uh, PPT, but now I know it's through Zoom. Okay. I, is it okay? Is it, is it correct? Eric, tell me. Yes. <laughs> it is working well. Yeah. Eric, is go it ahead, okay? Eric. Yes, go ahead, Eric. Okay, okay. So, what do we expect from uh, rubber agroforestry in terms of sustainability? Globally, it's through mainly income diversification. It's rubber plus something else. It's generally intercrops during immature period, fruit and timber during mature period. And it provides a, a better 
uh, economic uh, resilience and uh, so uh, a better sustainability as the um, income coming from the plot is not only depending from rubber. As you know, there is a very high rubber um, volatility uh, um, and, and it's a real problem. The good news with rubber is that rubber is one of the best uh, 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 tree that can be adapted for agroforestry. I'm also working on coffee, cocoa, clove, and other system. And the thing is that globally, what we have seen is that there is no impact on agroforestry practices on, on rubber production in general. I say in general, not in situation where you might have competition. We will see that later on as long as there is no trees above rubber canopy. So rubber production is generally not in competition with associated crops, at least in places where the climate and the soils can allow this, um, uh, this combination. Uh, the reservoir of local biodiversity and the forest effect of agroforestry uh, is probably very positive on climate. However, it's quite sure that we don't have that much measurement about that. So we see that the more biomass there is, the more trees there is, the more carbon we're going to have, the less erosion we're going to have, but it has not been always fully assessed. So there is a good potential mitigation um, possibilities for agroforestry, but it's still to be assessed. And, and still to be uh, verified through measurement in the field. Less soil erosion, that's almost sure, at the condition, as uh, Philippe Thaler and others said, that there is some weeds on the soil. And so, indirectly, a better use of water as vegetal biodiversity increase a forest-like behavior. This is maybe the key word linked with um, uh, agroforestry concerning sustainability and uh, mitigation adaptation to uh, climate change, it's forest-like behavior. The soil fertility maintenance or improvement, if soil is covered by grasses and shrubs, we have seen that uh, uh, today in the, in the morning. There is a possibility of timber production, and timber is very well adapted as it's a long-term production and it doesn't require that much uh, maintenance. And uh, up to 50 trees hectare is definitely not a problem. We have seen that in Thailand and Indonesia. And then the only problem is that with such association, you've got the result of the association at the end of the lifespan of rubber. It's globally environmentally friendly. And the idea is how can we re-internalize the externalities? That's a real challenge. So in other words, uh, we are pretty sure that more uh, biomass, more biodiversity and so on is uh, definitely positive in terms of sustainability, but we still have to measure it properly. Rubber trees do not require high quantities of fertilizer. We have seen that. And uh, a few amount of fertilizer can have a relatively good effect on growth, probably not that much on production. And then it's not completely necessary. It's not like, uh, for instance, uh, all pine, which require one ton of uh, NPK per year and per hectare. So rubber, and it doesn't require almost any pesticide as there is no treatment really against the disease. So rubber is already biocompatible, which is a, a relatively good news. And then we have seen that we have effect of high temperatures on physiology of rubber trees and uh, rubber production. It's quite clear. We have seen that since two days. But agroforestry may, I say may, might, could, should play a positive role to maintain a good climatic condition through the fact that the more biomass, the more moisture. But we will see that it could also link to some new constraints. So uh, 25 years ago, we uh, intended a program called the Rubber Agroforestry System with our colleagues of IRI, Gede Wibawa, and uh, ICRAF. And the idea was effectively to um, uh, combine clonal rubber with other crop, intercrops or uh, 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 timber and fruit trees and associated trees to shade against imperata and so on. We don't have that much time to put a lot of details on that, but that was based on, on the fact that there is already 25% of farmers who do agroforestry practices 
with clonal rubber in Indonesia, which is probably one of the countries where it's, it's most developed uh, a little bit with Thailand, which is less, and probably Sri Lanka. Now, what is the situation today in West Kalimantan, for instance? Uh, today, we had uh, mainly jungle rubber uh, uh, yesterday, but today now we have 70% uh, of the uh, zone covered by all pine, 20% by clonal rubber, including agroforestry and monoculture, 10% remains in all jungle rubber, and probably around 25% of farmers have agroforestry system. I said probably because we don't have uh, um, uh, real figures for all the country, but we have at least some uh, 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 possibility to measure it. In southern Thailand, we made uh, the study with uh, our colleagues from uh, Taksin University in Patalung, and we see a lot of different systems. Um, rubber with uh, knetum, which is a local shrub used uh, uh, locally, longkong, mangustin, levistinia, salak, guava, and a lot of also crops during immature period. So there is a, a really wide range of possibilities, but we must say also that it's in a place where all conditions are very, very favorable. The climate, the soil is very favorable, and even the clone, RIM 600, doesn't provide as much shade as a PB260 or GT1. So it's a perfect clone to make some good agroforestry practices, I must admit. Uh, then we made some calculation about what is the economic output in terms of gross margin per hectare. And it's quite clear that if we compare to monoculture on the red line, we have at least four systems which are far above uh, the gross margin of uh, clonal monoculture and all farmers that have some agroforestry practices put that in, in, in put a focus on that economically speaking that's far more interesting that, that than monoculture and then for instance on this uh, calculation you could see uh, on uh, on red uh, the monoculture output on uh, blue the current uh, real economic output with generally 25 to 50% of rubber and agroforestry. And what could be the global output in, if all plots were in agroforestry, it's in green. And then we see that de definitely agroforestry practices provide an economic advantage and so provide more sustainability and more stability in income, in particular in a context where you could see that the rubber price is, uh, is, is moving from very low to very high, but uh, most of the time, two thirds of the time, is, is rubber low than high. And that's a problem. The second thing is that so there is a, a decrease in rubber interest in some areas, and in particular in Indonesia, where most people move to oil pine. So the production of rubber is still the same in Indonesia. But it doesn't increase like, uh, like we can see that in other countries, in, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, or in particular in Thailand. The other thing is that there is no quality pricing. So basically, people on, doesn't have any interest and incentive to make some good quality. So they all move to slab and so on to globally couple them of relatively low quality. But it's good enough for the industry. So, so far, so good. What we can see is that if we look at the uh, rubber price since um, uh, almost uh, 30 years, for 20 years in that case, we see that most of the time the rubber price is low. And then when the rubber price is low, uh, agroforestry systems are very economically interesting. And that's good news, at least for agroforestry. We made some uh, uh, measurement in Thailand, for instance. You can see that globally, for on-farm and off-farm diversification is very important, up to 50% of the gross margin of the farm. And then if we look at those who are effectively doing agroforestry practices, they are not so much. Uh, on the total uh, sample of the survey that has been implemented by Benedict Chambon, who is, uh, still, uh, who is now in Burma and has been almost 10 years in Thailand, it was 10% of people having agroforestry practices, 60% in the south, which is the heart of agroforestry, but only 03 in northeast and 33 in center east. So, uh, and among these 16% of people having agroforestry, 
they don't put all their uh, uh, rubber in agroforestry. So in fact, the real area under agroforestry is probably around 5% in, uh, in Thailand. So the lessons we've got from Indonesia and Thailand basically is that if rubber agroforestry trials in Indonesia arrived in time 30 years ago, uh, things have changed with the arrival of oil pine and other alternatives. So is the uh, agroforestry practices still interesting for local people? The answer is yes, but it will have to be shared with other crops and in particular oil pine. Um, we have seen also that one of the most important problems uh, in, 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 in Indonesia was the very poor tapping practices that limits the rubber lifespan to less than 25 years, in average 20 years. So if in Thailand we've got trees that can be uh, used until 30, 35 years, this is not anymore the case in Indonesia. So here we have definitely a problem. And we have seen also a lot of white root disease, um, which is a real problem in Indonesia. In Thailand, uh, as the global costs are more important than in, um, in Indonesia, the fact that agroforestry provide an income diversification is a very good incentive to move to, uh, to agroforestry. So the thing is that, okay, we have seen all these things, but what is the impact of agroforestry on possibility to adapt and or mitigate the climatic change? So far, I must admit something, we don't have that much proof or uh, measurement about that. But what we see is that when we have a forest-like environment, we have more moisture, we have less erosion, we have more water in the ground table, and, and basically we expect that this forest-like environment will probably have an impact on climate change closer to a forest than to a monoculture of rubber. So probably it is expected and probable that we would have some uh, positive externalities in terms of climatic change. But I must admit that we still have to measure that. And thanks to the agronomist to do the job for us and to effectively provide that. Um, the problem that can uh, 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 arise are, are, are twofold. The first one is competition for water. It's probably the most important. For instance, in Jambi or in, uh, in Kalimantan, in, uh, in, in places like Thailand, in, in Patalung, we don't have that much competition for water. It's not a problem. But what about South Sumatra now? What about Myanmar, where you have a lot of water in rainy season and no water at all in dry season? then definitely we have to take care because the systems in agroforestry that works in Indonesia and Thailand may not work in other places and in particular in marginal situations where there is this competition for water. The second thing is shade. Uh, what we have seen since 30 years is that as soon as there is no shade on rubber, rubber is okay and rubber production is okay. So, Every system is good as soon as you don't have trees, in particular some timber trees or even durian trees, for instance, that are above that of rubber. But as rubber, generally rubber lifespan is uh, limited to uh, 30, 35 years, generally that doesn't happen. So it's not really a problem. And uh, we also have to see the problem of possible allelopathy for some trees in association according to the climatic condition. So to conclude, what next? Um, well, we suggest we effectively uh, look for and adapt uh, rubber agroforestry practices adapted first to local market, which is the main incentive, the demand, and the new or evaluating climatic condition. Explore the intercropping possibilities as it is very important for farmers to have at least some income during the immature period and it's a critical period, and identify as well the other cash crop and or timber species that could be grown in good condition. And generally, that is a good incentive to do it in a double spacing with large interspace. But then at that time, we have a, a trade-off between rubber and other associated trees. And, and that's the market, the price, and the economic reason that will give us what is the best uh, uh, possibilities for, for this association. And of course, 
looking to the local condition in terms of soil, but also in terms of water, water demand, water supply, and in a, in a global world, climatic condition, to be sure that there is no competition or not too much competition for either rubber or associated trees. So most farmers are capable to effectively implement uh, 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 rubber agroforestry practices. We have seen that almost everywhere, maybe except in Cambodia and Vietnam, where it's not very well developed. Um, but uh, uh, there is definitely a scope to, to, to promote that. But we need also to prove that uh, agroforestry has also uh, positive externalities in terms of climatic change. The second thing is that we need also to have national regulation uh, in, in, in if, if possible, to be accorded to the right of the farmers to use their trees the way they want, which is not the case, for instance, in Ivory Coast, where people cannot process themselves and do what they want with their timber trees. Uh, so thank you for your attention. We finish that on some nice picture of agroforestry system with different type of trees. Thank you very much. I hope I was in time. Can I complete mine now, sir? I will take okay. up. So, <coughs> thank you uh, to the last two presenters, oh, uh, Dr. Lakshman and uh, Dr. Eric yeah. yeah. Bono, okay. for keeping the time. Huh? We, we can have uh, maybe a very, very short uh, QA session. Ah. Dr. Mokafe is back? No. Is he? Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, I am. Please go on. Um, I'm uploading the screen. Okay. Yes, please. Yes, uh, the screen is coming up. The screen is coming up. Okay. Is the screen visible, yes, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. yes, okay. Let Go me... to the slide, slide show and yeah. where I start. Uh, and, uh, please, uh, Dr. Dr. Mokafe, try to finish in the next uh, seven minutes, please. Oh. Yes, please, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Nigeria, and the non-traditional rubber zones, as has been reported by Dr. Ramdi Hotman, is a forerunner to what we are presenting now, that rubber can be cultivated under difficult situations, different from the traditional areas. Uh, reforestation, yes, where the forest is completely degraded without the possibility of recovery, uh, rubber tree can be used to enhance the tree population, as we can see in Figo 1. A is a typical banner, and that can be recovered with rubber tree plantation. Again, we have degradation of mangrove. Many of the rubber producing countries are coastline countries, mangrove forests. We can see the degradation of mangrove from the typical mangrove to degraded mangrove. And see students that rubber is very resilient, it's more resilient than any of the traditional tree crops. And in Nigeria and many other rubber producing countries, uh, water tolerates, uh, sorry, rubber tolerates uh, wetlands. So it can be a suitable crop even for recovery of uh, degraded mangrove forests. Agroforestry, we have just had great potential for recovery of uh, tree population in degraded uh, forests. 
I treat intercropping, through mixed farming, where you can have small ruminant animals within the rubber canopy. Beekeeping is also a possibility as a component of a rubber tree-based agroforestry. And by so doing, we are contributing to climate change adaptation and mitigation. Silviculture, where the trees are of good value. We know that Malaysia has done very well developing the test in clones, which are very, very well fitting into silviculture, where trees are grown for good value and can be managed as per the land, space, the time interval, and the species. All of these can be regulated to ensure that at the point of exploitation, the, tree, the trees are not overexploited. The protection of rubber groups is very important. There are many abandoned rubber groups in also the rubber producing countries. All of these can be protected. And it, of course, in the traditional center of origin of rubber, there are rubber groups that can be protected for, from exploitation so that the trees can be a rich source of biodiversity as well as a carbon sink. Carbon credit is a possibility where uh, some countries that have exceeded their limit, some companies as well that have exceeded their limit, can buy, can pay for what they have exceeded from those countries or companies that are still within their limit or lesser than their limit. And that is the, the definition of carbon market, offer and sale. And this market is moderated within the framework of Kyoto Protocol that has been developed. So wherever there is an offer, wherever there is sale, it is within the framework of the Kyoto Protocol. The red loss is also a possibility, though there is a limitation for rubber in this case, because red loss works with virgin forests, not secondary forests, as we may have for many rubber plantations. However, it is not a close case, because we have mentioned the rubber groups that are primary forests that can be projected for red loss facility. The, the, the red plus plantations are not to be exploited, but uh, the benefiting communities are giving social amenities to compensate for what they might lose for not exploiting the plantations that are designated as red plus plantations. The red plus, red plus scheme also have its own protocol to follow, which is uh, available when we are interested. Of course, the holistic approach which I mentioned earlier on, because Social advantage is important. The, the, the resource poor farmers, the rural community dwellers with very low poverty index need to be taken care of just as we are taking care of uh, climate change. And rubber comes in handy. This has also been mentioned in earlier presentations uh, this morning. Rubber is relevant to the SDGs. For instance, we are talking of affordable and clean energy, rubber seed as a source of biofuel, Climate action, all that has been said to so far, rubber tree based agro, agro applications are relevant to climate action, SDG 13. Life below water, there is successful aquaculture within the rubber canopy. Fishery has been done in some areas, even in Nigeria, within the rubber canopy. And of course, life on land, all that has been said so far is relevant to SDG 15, life on land. There are other SDGs where rubber application may not be so much, but also relevant. Uh, no poverty, officers, poor farmers, community dwellers, GFO, minimizing, if not eliminating uh, poverty. The arable crops and animals in mixed farming contribute to food, the food needs of the immediate uh, environment. Industry, of course, rubber is an economic crop, which a lot of products, a lot of industrial products, so it can contribute to SDG 9, reduced inequality when there is revenue, when the GDP increases, inequality reduce, either inequality among nations or inequality among individuals. Forging partnerships, which is the main focus of IRDB and all the partners that are participating in this project, is relevant to SDG 17 which is Partnership for Growth. And I want to believe that at the end of this presentation, we'll have some linkages that we can take advantage on to improve on rubber cultivation. In conclusion, an overview of the stages of climate change was traced to trees and heavy The Rubber tree was presented with its potentials 
to contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation. I am grateful to my institute for projecting me in this instance and to the, co to the course organizers for this e-conference in view of the COVID-19 restrictions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mukafe, for respecting uh, totally the time. Huh? So Thank you. Uh, Thank we, uh, we have now finished the presentations for this morning uh, session, this afternoon session for Asia. Uh, so uh, let's see if there are some uh, different uh, questions. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there is a, a question about the rubber agroforestry systems. Uh, so the, the question is mainly for Eric Peno and maybe for Dr. Jesse if she's there, and maybe also Dr. Lakshman. Uh, it says that, uh, so this uh, uh, question by Denis Sonnoir, rubber agroforestry system seems to be practiced mainly by smallholders. Is it possible to be adopted by the agro-industry? What is the situation of a rubber agroforestry systems in West and Central the, Africa? The, the answer is definitely yes, but most estates do not practice agroforestry for generally a single reason, if you discuss with them, uh, they are used to produce rubber. Everything uh, in the company is oriented through rubber and uh, they don't know what to do with the associated uh, trees. So intercrops, no way, it's too difficult for them. They, they don't have any interest in that. If they, if they produce another one, cocoa, coffee, whatsoever, then they will have to integrate this uh, commodity system as well in their system, and they don't like it. I have the impression, but still to be discussed, that the only crop that uh, could be interested for them is timber, because once you planted it, you let it grow, and you cut it at the same time as rubber. Then you can have effectively uh, an economic output. But basically, that's the reason why estate are not that much interested. Michelin made a lot of uh, experiment in, uh, in South America, in Brazil, but uh, uh, their conclusion uh, were that, okay, it's interesting, but not for us. Okay, there is another question. Uh, what is the situation of rubber agroforestry systems in West and Central Africa? Alors, there is a, a, a good specialist of, uh, of cocoa agroforestry system, Elsa Sanyal. We made recently a, a survey on rubber farmers. We, more or less, they are very linked to cocoa, uh, as, as, as rubber is a diversification for cocoa farmers in these places. And very, very few do practice agroforestry. And uh, probably, it has to be verified, just because the, the main design available in, in Ivory Coast, for instance, in Ghana, was monoculture. So people don't know if they can grow or not, and, 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 and they never had the opportunity to try because it's a relatively recent boom. They don't, they, they don't have any experience in agroforestry, so they don't know if they can do it or not. Okay. There is, there is also question. probably problems of local market. If you grow timber, uh, timber, you, you, they are not interested because they don't have the control on timber. And fruits, if there is no fruit market, if you are not close to the capital, then there is no way to effectively valorize the associated crops. Okay, Eric, there is another question for you uh, from Mr. Vinu Gobinat for, uh, from uh, Michelin SNPT uh, about the planting of teak as a timber intercrop. In, do, you, do you have experience of it in Thailand with farmers and what, what is your idea on that? Um, so the, the thing is that uh, 20 years ago my answer could have been uh, the thing is that when rubber grows there is too much water for teak. Teak at that time needed at least uh, four or five uh, months, relatively dry months, to have a good development. But it's not anymore true as there is some uh, teak varieties which now can be grown in the same environment of rubber. So uh, what we have seen with Benedict Chambon uh, um, some years ago when we did some, uh, some surveys in Patalung, we have seen some plots where um, uh, the timber trees, uh, between uh, 50 to 80 trees per hectare, were mainly mahogany and teak. So it's, um, I think it's depending on the market. 
There is a, a good market in Thailand. It's depending on the fact that some new varieties are available, available now. It's still a few farmers who are doing that, but we have seen that. So it's probably a, a good um, a potential uh, in the very next future, a good potential association. Okay, there is another question for Dr. Lakshman uh, regarding Sri Lanka. So in Sri Lanka, uh, do all the stakeholders of the rubber value chain are aware of the role of rubber on climatic change, climate change mitigation? And what is the collaboration between the rubber sector and the Red Plus stakeholders? Uh, okay, that means at the moment we are not working on the Red Plus. Then there are some initiatives going on for on the research side to see the feasibility of going for the Red Plus. But at the moment, main target is to build up the, uh, the project for the world carbon market. It seems that it's quite feasible. And uh, then next thing is our main idea is, especially in the country, uh, to make our rubber product manufacturers, make them carbon neutral. That's the way th we are thinking of selling the carbon uh, credits. So especially in our country, you know, that I mean, uh, we are net importer of the natural rubber because most of the rubber produced in the country being uh, utilized for value addition. Same time, we import a lot of uh, raw rubber from other countries. And especially uh, with the rubber cultivated in new areas, once we build up the for one carbon projects, our aim is to uh, go for a neutral carbon uh, rubber products. Again, giving some addition, value addition, uh, further value addition to rubber. Okay. Finally, and I think it will be the last question. I uh, said so there is a question for Dr. Romo Café. Uh, Mr. Sonwa uh, Denis asks uh, why the rubber industries prefer to go to the humid natural forest area and uh, do not want to move to humid savanna areas. Um, there is the effort to cultivate uh, rubber in the humid savanna. In my presentation, I did say that in Nigeria, we will have a station located in the humid savanna. And in my paper presented in a Cote d'Ivoire, though I was not there, but in the proceedings, we were projecting the place of rubber in the humid savanna. We are encouraging it. There's a paper too at the international level where there is even a suggestion that the entire grasslands could be replanted in such a way that after making provision for human uh, habitation, uh, dairy farming and all the rest of it, the rest could be planted to tree crops. So it's a very, very strong point even at the international level. So we are not discouraging it, we are promoting it and it's encouraged. Robert tree is suitable here. Uh, I would like to speak to the issue of uh, agroforestry in West Africa. Yes, there's a report on uh, Ghana, there's a report on, on, uh, on the situation in Cote d'Ivoire. In Nigeria, since the 90s, we have been promoting intercropping, uh, basic agroforestry practices, like I mentioned, they even up to mixed farming with uh, small ruminant animals. And our farmers are very, very receptive to it, and it's so encouraging that uh, our farmers are taking up uh, agroforestry in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mukafe, and uh, you say it was an opportunity that you could join this morning, uh, this morning session, and yeah, the visit of adoption, <laughs> huh, because uh, in fact your your speech was uh, very much related to mitigation and adoption. So I think there are, there are not any more new. I just check uh, new yeah. questions. Yes, this is only I a remark from Jacob Mathieu. Hmm? Yeah. If, okay. if I may. Yes, Alexandre. Yeah, uh, I was very interested by, by the presentation of, of Dr. Lakshman on the, the, the way the additional income is used by smallholders. Um, First, the role it can play in, in social resilience, because I think this is something which is so important, especially if we want to advocate
for more funding for action on adaptation of, of, of rubber and and especially on the fact that part of that income is a relatively important part of that income is used for investment, health, education, social investment, and, and physical investment, um, which reminds me a bit things that has happened in China at the moment of the expansion of rubber. Is it where the, so it means that the rest of their income is coming from other sources. Is that the case? The income for day-to-day -day expenses. Yeah, actually that means especially the most of the income is coming from rubber now. At the same time, they do intercrop with their seasonal crops. That means part of the income is coming from those seasonal crops as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I think, and, that, and, it's, and I think it, it, it's also something interesting when you think about the fact that um, it is a culture where you have in majority smallholders and there is this difficulty of, of the price fluctuations. So the, the way you use your income and, and the other sources of income are ways to build resilience not only to climate change but to all types of, of shocks so it's I, it's very interesting well that especially if you look at the rubber cultivation in non-traditional areas in sri lanka probably that would be the case for other countries as well because those areas the farmers they are if you look at the labor value for the labor opportunity cost for the labor is not much they have enough labor and they do engage themselves in the farm and Ultimately, whatever income they get from the rubber, whatever price, is still adding to their family income. And uh, not, but in traditional areas, the people hire other people, uh, hire workers to do farm work, even for tapping. Therefore, ultimately, if you look at the profit margin, it's nothing much after spending so much money for labor. And then the, when rubber prices are, are poor, then they can't get good income. But non-traditional areas, the drier climates, there's a completely different scenario. They, they, whatever the price, still that's the income for them, that's the net profit for them. Okay, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, so uh, thank you to the eight presenters of this morning uh, sessions for the excellent quality of their papers. Uh, they could uh, address so say, the diversity of the mitigation and adaptation rules of rubber plantations. Uh, Dr. Jan first uh, started to show the role, potential role of rubber in regulation of climate uh, by bringing a, a lower tem soil temperatures compared to grass uh, or uh, arable lands. And this was confirmed after by a presentation of Dr. Lakshman. Uh, there were many, many pre presentations showing the role of the soil cover uh, who appeared as a major uh, uh, major importance regarding the, 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 uh, the maintenance of soil properties, regarding fertility, regarding uh, uh, erosion, uh, with effect on the cations and the pH and so on. Huh? And so it was very obvious that the uh, former practices of bare soil huh, has to be totally eradicated uh, for further sustainability. Uh, the presentation of Dr. Uh, Minami uh, opened on the role of genetic diversity and especially the over rubber species uh, for the future breeding uh, in order to adapt uh, to the new conditions of growing. Uh, the presentation of Dr. Fatima uh, showed uh, that who said the role of natural rubber as a substitute to synthetic rubber was maybe underestimated uh, and underpromoted. And uh, Dr. Mukafe showed very well, looks say, huge areas huh, uh, going to the sustainable development goals of rubber right, in, maintaining, in maintaining social and natural con um, degraded context, like a degraded forest, even degraded mang mangroves. I didn't know that rubber could be established on degraded mangroves. <laughs> I learned something. 
So thank you very much uh, for all the participants. Uh. Eric, of course, uh, described all the diversity of the agroforestry systems, uh, tackling also the possible uh, issues uh, that these uh, systems could uh, bring under much more limited water supply uh, uh, if we have uh, increased water, water climate phenomena. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to the attendants. Also, we are a little bit late compared to the program, 25 minutes late. I give back the, the floor to the organizers. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, thank you Jeff. Good. Thank you very much. OK. So, Alexandre, uh, Fabio? Back. No. Okay, maybe. So, thank you to, to everybody. So, this was our second day, and, and tomorrow will be the third and, and final one, uh, drawing conclusions and, and elements for this broad survey of, of research results to go towards what can be do done in terms of policies and, and, and measures in the climate change uh, negotiations and discussion context. We already had some insight about it with the discussions on how can we use the carbon markets, how can we use Red Plus as tools. So these are among the topics that will be discussed tomorrow. Same time, same place. Goodbye. And thank you for to all the technical team behind and to all of you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you all tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.